Daniel with Integrity Painting. I got Michael Gore Hickman here with Painter Growth. Um, hey, how's it going? So there's his website down at the bottom right there. If you guys are looking to grow your business, um, tell us a little bit about Painter Growth, man. It's good to see you. Yeah, what's up, man? Uh, good to hang with you again since you know meeting you at the expo a few weeks ago. I mean, a couple months ago already now. Jeez, time time flies. Um, but yeah, I mean, Painter Growth, we we coach painting contractors how to grow their business, right? So everything from sales, marketing, uh, lead generation, recruiting, leadership, finances, moving a piece rate, adding crews, adding production managers, sales reps, just kind of the step-by-step -step process to do all that. And yeah, I mean, we've worked with just about 500 contractors in the last two and a half years. So it's been pretty Dang. fun. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So uh, yeah, it seems like the PCA was like, like just the other day, like ever since I've been back, I've been just like doing so much. And like, I joined a couple groups since I left there. So I got a bunch of painters that I talk to every day. And just like, how did you like the PCA? Yeah, I mean, that was my first expo ever. I thought I thought they did a great job. I mean, I think there was there was definitely room for improvement. I think some of the breakout rooms were a little bit done weird. I think the hotel was just a little bit too big for that size of event. It was like, you know, you had to walk like 10 minutes to go from one side to the other. I didn't really like that. But I mean, hanging out with like so many awesome like minded people in the industry, meeting the other vendors and a ton of the contractors there. It was awesome. I loved it and um, stoked for next year. Yeah, actually even stoked to get more involved with the PCA you know, throughout the year and not just, not just the expo. So I'll probably see you cause I'm going to the commercial one. There's a PCA commercial. I'm going to be going to that one. Um, they haven't dropped the location on the PCA yet that I know of, but as where was that I last find, year? Uh, last year it was in ten Nashville, Tennessee, nice. uh, the, co the commercial one. And then yeah. the actual PCA was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you said you got 500 painting contracts that you worked with last year? Um, no, since like in the last two and a half years, we've worked with just about 500. So 450 and change uh, independent painting contractors. What businesses. range? Like what's their range? Like uh, I know like uh, what sizes are they? Like are they like 500, 200? Yeah. So our, our kind of like specialty is anywhere from startup to like a million or so per year, mm. right? And really helping people like getting that fundamental business knowledge um, that you never got. Like would people usually, you know, pay for a four year business degree instead of having to go through that and learn all these things that you don't know? How can we teach you just those things so that you have the highest chances of success in your painting business? Um, we do have some client, like we have in our advanced one-on-one program, we have a ton of clients between that, like one and 3 million range. Um, and we have our, our biggest client, I think he's doing about 800 K a month, but on average, like the majority of our clients are kind of between like 200 and 600 K per year, mm. looking to professionalize, looking to systemize, looking to get either off the tools or out of the day to day and, uh, really scale up lead flow, close better, bring on a sales rep. And, uh, we help through that whole, whole process. Did they even have coaches like 10 years ago? Cause I've never heard of this until recently. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, a big, a big driving force in the industry 10 years ago, I mean a, a little bit today, but more so 10, 15, 20 years ago was, um, believe it or not, like the whole student painting thing. So like the student painters, I, I was a member of, or I was a franchise owner with college pro, um, same with, uh, actually Jason Paris. He did mm -hmm. the same, like we did the same thing around the same time. I think he was a little bit after me. So um, what that student painters is, is actually like business in a box training, how to run a business. And the front of it is just a painting company. So you learn systems, you learn tools, you learn marketing, you learn sales. And it just happens to be in the, uh, in the, you know, in the frame of a painting company. And so because of that, like a lot of like, um, for example, the guy who created 1-800-GOT-JUNK, right? He did a college pro franchise, uh, Brian Scudamore, he started there and then moved into. So there's a lot of really great businesses that came out of that. But yeah. there's also a lot of really great entrepreneurs who actually stayed in the painting space because of their experience in student painting, whether it's like, you know, like Jason Paris, or um, actually, I know Justin Georgopoulos, he did a student painting thing. Um, there's tons, I mean, I'm blanking on the rest of them right now. But it was a really good like influx of talent 
into the painting space, those students. And then since then, college prep actually shut down. So we're, um, you know, kind of like filling a little bit out of that gap of the, the painters who want to be formally educated in business. Um, and we're kind of taking on that role. Yeah. Yeah. I know tons of people that come from those programs that that's where they got all their like background and their, their foundation. Cause when I first started out, I basically just was trial and error for 10 years and all like, there was always little problems and I didn't know who to, how to fix them or who to go to, to fix them. Because if I talk to other painters in town, like they don't want to help me cause like the they're trying to grow their company and they don't want to help somebody else out. So I almost feel bad posting this because I don't want to be helping all these guys that, you know, we that that, you know, didn't help us. And it's like now we got all these opportunities um, with coaches like um, I just hired. Uh, I just signed up for the program through Justin uh, Gorgopoulos for uh, for door to door and uh, the sales. Yeah. And. Though, and I've been interested in sales for so long, like door to door, because people come to my house all the time. And I'm always like, man, mm. these guys have. To, and I was like, hey, how many how many leads you guys get? Um, do you guys make good money? And they're always like, yeah, we we make good money. We get lots of leads. So I started looking into the door to door because I didn't know that was like I know that's what yeah. I had to do to make money or I wouldn't eat when I was starting out. So, yeah. I mean, we have like a, we have a super thorough and comprehensive door to door training program. Like what's one of the lead generation tactics that we train. Um, and then the, the angle on it is not just how you can go door to door, but how can you actually build a team so that it gets off of your plate, um, mm. as quickly as possible. I mean, I know Justin's crushed it with his door to door. He actually, he was crushing it. Um, but then he also joined our program for a little bit, a couple of years ago. Um, and sh him sharing some of the wins that he was getting door to door, door to door, getting like hundred plus leads per week. Um, I mean, we've had lots of other clients since then, you know, hit those kinds of numbers, but yeah, door to door is a great untapped opportunity in most markets, not all markets in most markets that, that people aren't really taking advantage of, especially if you go into it with that mindset of like, how can I do the thing first, get the result and then systemize it and get it off of my plate. And that's how most kind of aspects of business should be looked at is like, how can you do it first, get the results, systemize it, and then get it off of your plate so we can keep running while you go now build something else in your business. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, I've been trying to get a whole bunch of my friends to get into door to door. Um, cause I'm in a bunch of painting groups and like, I just don't know if they like, they're just, they don't know yet, but as soon as they hire a couple door to door guys or even one, like this winter, we doubled our, we doubled our leads and sales. Like, yeah. So it's got this like super negative connotation, right? Cause no one like, it's not, it's not a human nature to want to go introduce yourself to strangers and like present your services. It's just not a comfortable thing to do. And so, I mean, especially early on when we we're, when we we're really launching painter growth and our, our blueprint, um, we would almost like, like we were very diligent, like very, uh, not diligent, but, uh, conscious of how we introduce like that specific concept to clients when they when they joined because if we just like went through the process like okay now we're going to go door to door blah 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 like there's going to be some resistance to that idea unless you introduce it to them properly it's like okay so now what we want to do is like hey just to confirm you want to get more leads right right you want to do them as cheaply as possible right okay so we're going to introduce something to you right now you're going to immediately like you're going to have kind of a gut reaction to it you might not like it but trust me for at least like let me explain it and I'm going to show you how this is going to work for you. OK, so we're going to show you actually how to build door to door teams to generate leads on demand for you in the neighborhoods that you want with the types of projects that you want. Like, how does that sound? Do you want to learn a little bit more? It's like, OK, you know, that that's going to be received differently than just saying, hey, Daniel, um, you want to go door to door marketing? You're yeah. like, uh, maybe not. <laughs> no. Yeah. Right? So I'm going to actually use that script that you just <laughs> I'm gonna use that. I'm trying to hire, I'm hiring two more door to door guys right now. And I feel like it's a great opportunity. Like if I was a younger guy, I would have loved to have the opportunity to get leads, get paid a commission on it, learn how to sell. And then also, um, cause like my sales guy, he's in charge of all the door to door guys. So like, then they get to work with him directly and they can go learn from him and do ride alongs. And then that's a perfect opportunity for them to get into a sales position 
And yeah. I didn't know that sales guys could make, you know, 200 K a year uh, for paint sales. Like I didn't know that. So when I heard that, I was like, man, that would have, I wish I would have like known yeah. that was a real job at least. Like I didn't even, it's crazy. So well, what if I told you, you could make six figures going door to door, like your door to door marketers could make six figures. Really? Yeah. Like how do you, how do you pay your marketers right now? Your door to door guys. Them hourly and then we give them 3% commission on every. Okay. I saw that. I saw that on your ad. So what I would encourage you to do is front load that commission on the estimate, on the, the attended estimate and not the book sale. And you you can figure out that number by kind of reverse engineering your business's numbers um, and your ideal marketing spend. So in your residential side, what's your average job size? Uh, 8,000, like eight to 9,000, like right let's in there. Let's say 8K, that's a clean number. And what's your, uh, and so if you want to keep marketing spend at like, what, 5%? Yeah, it's under that, but yeah. Let's say let's say you want to keep it at five percent, okay? So that means that's four hundred dollars per job that you can spend. How many? What's your sales guys' close rate? How many estimates do they need to go on to close a job? Um, they were closing one out of thirty uh, last last uh, last pay period. So one one estimate out of thirty estimates. Oh wait, no, that was uh, sorry, that was one of my. Um, Let's see. Yeah, I was like, you need some new sales guys. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it was uh two. Sorry, I I was only counting one of the sales guys. Uh, so um, I had my project manager close four of them, and then my sales guy closed two, and then he just closed that one there. So that's three. So uh, seven, seven out of thirty. So maybe we got to work on some things still. But yeah, do you have some like you don't have some tracking dashboards for your sales guys? Uh, we kind of just started all this. So. Yeah. You should talk to Jason Paris about his tracking on how he tracks his sales. He's got like five residential estimators, dashboards, all that. I mean, not even, you don't even have to go to Jason, go to like um, one of the other guys at Paris. Uh, uh, I'm just blank. I'll get your name, but they have okay. great tracking dashboards. So let's say, so you said like seven out of 20, that's 35%. Let's say one out of three, right? Let's say they close one out of three. Okay. And we're trying to get to a $400 cost per acquisition. So if we divide that by three, that's $133 per, um, per estimate that you can spend. Okay. So on average, a door to door person should be able to get about one estimate per hour. A good one should be able to get more, but say they get one estimate per hour. And if you need three estimates to book a job, you can pay them like $133 an hour. Right. If they just yeah. get one estimate per hour and your sales guys close one out of three. So you could pay something like like being creative, 25 bucks an hour base and seventy five dollars per booked estimate. Now, if you're presenting that compensation plan to somebody, twenty five bucks base plus seventy five bucks a booked estimate, um, all of a sudden they got to get one estimate an hour to make one hundred dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. So now you're thinking, what type of person can I attract who would be willing to work for a hundred dollars an hour? Wow. You can, you don't have to, you're not looking at students or like high school, you know, GED equivalents. Now you're looking at like university graduates, professional salespeople, like car, sa car salesmen, sales managers, like legit professionals who can go door to door, represent your business, make a hundred bucks plus an hour. Not only are they going to hit those baseline metrics, but they're going to do much more than that maybe make $200 an hour and think of that first impression that you're, you're providing your clients. Yeah. And then the last thing is that for human motivation, you're bringing their, what they're in control of closer to what they're compensated for. So if they're comped on sales commission and they're not responsible for that sale, then they're going to have that feeling of disconnection from their result. It's like, Oh, I can go do all these estimates, but I still got to wait for the sales guy to close. It's like, that sucks. But if I can book the estimate, I can set the expectation and make sure that it's a, it's a shown estimate that doesn't cancel. I'm responsible for that outcome and I can guarantee that. Wow. Right. So you have that accountability, which is directly tied to their compensation. Hmm. Do, and then they just have the sales guy come close it. Yeah. Then they just, well then, so then from, from the setup, so the, the door to door guy will schedule the estimate at the door, right? Ideally using something like Calendly or drip jobs or something where they can get the confirmations and the reminders. Then that night or sometime before the estimate, the salesperson calls them and we, they do something called the setup call. We have a, we have a, 
like a 10 step script we call lights out setup call. But basically on that call, you do like job scope, decision makers, timeline, budget, and then most importantly, trial close, right? All right, Mr. And Mrs. Jones or Mr. Jones, um, got you scheduled, you know, for tomorrow at 10 a.m. I'm going to come out. We're going to take a look at your property. And assuming the price is fair and you trust that we're going to do a good job, are you going to be ready to schedule in with us? Right. So is it is the price if the price is fair and you trust us, are you going to be ready to schedule? And all you're looking for there is a yes or no. You're not going to like deal with the objection, but it just like just helps you understand what their buying mindset is at and what objections you're going to be facing when you actually get to the estimate. Mm. So we call it the trial close, super important to do on the setup call. And then we also do the trial close two more times during the estimate um, and then present on the spot. Uh, and then if you do all of those things, you should be closing, you know, 50 plus percent of, of estimates. Yeah, that'll really help us out a lot. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, we just we're just getting started on that. So uh, we actually just hired a sales guy in August and I was doing all the sales before and um, doing everything. So. A lot of the a lot of the stuff. Um, and you were so. doing mostly commercial before. No, we were doing residential and then some commercial. Um, and then um, I think the last PCA we went to was like um, the one be like last year, the beginning of last year. Um, that's when I found out you could get like a coach, and there was actually like systems to things. And I found out like there's so many other painters that are actually that's it's scalable. Like I didn't even, I just thought it was like painting, like, you know, I'm just doing this to get by. And then, you know, one day I'll get out of here and do something else. But then when I met a bunch of people that were doing a lot bigger numbers, I was like, Oh, it's like, I got to figure out what these guys are doing. And all of them always po pointed me towards getting a coach, like every single one. And they're like, you need to get a coach. You need to get a coach. And so um, that's pretty crazy that, you know, just getting, uh, co and I even talked to realtors and other people and they all got coaches too, the ones that are successful. And so I mean, if you want your business to be like elite, right? Like what's an elite business, maybe a 5 million, even a $1 million plus business, you know, 3% of businesses ever make 1 million 0.1% of businesses ever get to 10 million. So that's like, you're getting an elite territory there. And if you're, if you can, you know, can exchange that to like an athlete, to be in like the top 3% of athletes, you need a coach. It's like non-negotiable. To be in the 0.1% yeah. of athletes, it's like you need a you need a, t a team of coaches. You need a nutrition coach, you need a sports coach, you need a mobility coach, and you need a whatever coach, right? And so business should be looked at in the exact same way. When you're just getting started, like definitely get a business coach. One coach is gonna be enough from, from literally inception to maybe a couple million a year. Um, once you get to a couple million a year, now you need to start having potentially more coaches. Like you need that general business coach. Maybe you need a sales team coach like that. We just hired a sales team coach for my company to help with our sales program. I have my own business coach that I meet with on a weekly basis. Um, I just got back from a mastermind in Austin last week. It was super awesome. Um, so yeah, coaching is so important if you want to get not even like just grow, but like grow a lot faster than you would otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Like, like you grew a good business, but like it took you, what do you say? 10 years or something? Yeah. And, and I thought I was like, so we were doing, um, about, uh, 1.7 to 2 million, um, without any coaching. Like I just, I didn't know what I was doing basically like trial and error pretty much. Like, like front work too, right. You were like handling and, it all. And I got really good at like trying to figure out like, you like, Hey, I had a problem here. Um, this is how I solve it. This is how I'm going to avoid it next time. And we got really good and we started winning like awards, like best, best of the West. Um, uh, we got, we won best of the West the last three, uh, four years. Um, that was even before coaching, like, because we were providing a real good service, like a, a quality service, a high quality service. And so, um, and we were, one of the bigger, we were the biggest in town. Like we were becoming the biggest residential company in town already. So, um, and since I was doing a lot of project managing, I was doing a lot of office, I was doing like, um, accounting, um, I was doing all the sales. So like, there's some people that did get mad at me a few years ago because I didn't have enough time to get them 
their bids and estimates over because I was doing way too much. Yeah. So things are getting tough. Yeah. And then I went to the PCA and I seen all these guys that don't have to answer their phone. They're not, um, they're not setting up estimates like I am on the phone at the PCA. Um, and, and so I'm like, Hey, what's your guys' secret? And they're like, well, you know, you got to have an office person. You got to have, and I had some help in the office. Um, it just, I was doing a lot of it too, but like, um, uh, office person, a manager, they're like, what level are you at? And I tell them, they're like, oh, okay, you should have two project managers, not one. And then they're like, you need to have a sales guy. How many sales guys do you have? I'm like, I'm the sales guy. They're like, what, how are you doing that? And I'm like, yeah, yeah it sucks. Like it was a horrible, uh, it was like good. I was used to it. So I just, but then at the same yeah, you time, get, you get used to that, like threshold of pain. Yeah. And I'm like, why do I have so much anxiety? Why am I depressed? I'm making good money. Like what's going on? And then now it's like, I'm just like a totally different person. Like I'm so glad I have so much help. Like I would rather not try to save money and hire people to help me out from now on. Like trying to like, I'm so lucky I had my project manager. Um, He's still with me today, but he was help. He helped us so much. Like he was working 10 hour days too, like weekends, answering phones. Like he had it pretty crazy too. So, um, yeah, I'm I mean, just glad about a, a year ago or something. I, I had a realization even my own in my own business, maybe it was a year and a half ago. It was, um, and I kind of like turned it into a little quote, your ability to grow your business is limited only by your ability to delegate more and more complex tasks. It's true. So the bigger your business gets, the harder your tasks get and the more complicated they become to delegate. So like at the beginning, delegating painting is is pretty easy, right? It's easy to mm-hmm. hire a painter and have them go paint a house. But now you got to delegate sales and like that's a lot more challenging. And soon you're going to have to delegate sales management, right? Mm-hmm. Now you're delegating leadership roles and you're delegating real responsibility in your organization. And as soon as you your skill set gets to that point where you no longer have that ability to offload those tasks, you're going to get stuck with those tasks and you're not going to be able to devote your time to higher level, higher leverage, higher impact activities. And so that'll just be the limit of your business, which is fine. Everyone has a limit, but you know, I think it's like kind of in human nature to see what that limit is and keep pushing it, you know, a little bit further and a little bit further. So that's where, you know, up leveling yourself will open up new doors. Yeah. Right now I'm the sales manager, um, I do some office stuff, like oversee some office stuff, but we just moved my project manager that's been with us for 10 years. He's moving up to a general manager where he's going to be taking, he's already been taking over more of my day-to-day activities. Uh, and then a sales manager will be really, really nice. I'm trying to get my sales guy right now to, he's doing, he's doing good trying to move up into that position. Um, uh, uh, we just took that disc assessment test, so I'm able to figure out if he's a good Motivation. fit for that or not. Yeah, that's and I got that from uh, Jason Phillips, and also yeah, the, the delegating thing. Yeah, Jason Phillips posts every week. What did you delegate this week? And I'm like, okay, I got to delegate something, and I type it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have an exercise. We like right at the start. Um, you know, when people join our program, they always think like, all right. You know, we, we have this like revenue guarantee, right? Like book 30 K and all that. And so when people first join, like, Oh, can't wait to like learn lead generation day one. Um, and we kind of do a little bit of a gotcha moment. And because we show them that, you know, you actually have to learn, uh, you have to do some goal setting first, and then you need to learn some priority Mm -hmm. management before we get into lead generation and sales. (laughs) So you got to do a little bit of the dry stuff, right? You got to eat your vegetables Mm -hmm. so that you can earn the right to do the fun stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And what what priority manage? Well, first of all, what goal setting does um, is it is it writes your ship. What's important to you in your business? Is it is it money? Is it time freedom? Is it making an impact? Is it spending time with your family? Is it traveling? Like, what are you really working towards? And then how can we create that business to accomplish those goals? Because if you just work as hard as you can, you're going to get like like you were last year, right? Working a million, like just depressed and anxious, even though the business is doing well and you're making a lot of money that wasn't what was really important to you, right? Freedom and impact was important to you. So now you re, re, you redirected your ship and you're obviously a lot happier. So goal setting is number one. 
And then how are you going to do all of these new things that we're going to be teaching you? Right. And so that's where priority management comes in. And so we have three different exercises that we teach in our priority management training to get your time back. And we find that most painting contractors, most business owners can find like between 10 and 12 hours a week of busy work that they're doing that they can just either stop doing or they can delegate immediately. Um, uh, do delegate or dump so they can keep doing them. They can delegate them or they can dump them. Mm. And from there, it's about using a, a you know Google Calendar, a digital calendar to block schedule to be as effective as possible. Yeah, that's what really helped me out too is the doing the calendar and like sticking to the times and seeing what I'm doing every day and just putting it in every hour what I do and then being like, why am I doing this task every day? Like, and then I see like it's a whole job for somebody else. And then I had I had them overlapping each other where it was like. I was doing four or five things at the same hour and I was like, I got to get somebody to help. So like just started pawning them off. Like you said, dump them. Yeah. That's yep. so crazy. I didn't. Yeah. We, we started doing the calendar thing last year too. That really helped out. So. Yeah. So they go, we go oh, through. Goal setting um, and you had a painting manage. business. Before? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did. I ran a painting business for uh, three and a half, just about four years. Um, mostly residential. Then we got into a little bit of commercial at the end. Um, and then ended up, uh, mm -hmm. shutting it down so that I could move cities and follow a girl, <laughs> followed a girl to a different city. Um, turned out to be a good thing. Um, we're married now for going on 10 years mm -hmm. and we have two, two beautiful daughters together. So it was a good move, but I just didn't that feel like good. starting my painting business up in a new city. Um, at the, at that time, I actually got an opportunity to work for a software company. Um, it was a startup and I got to see what kind of a software company from startup to like within three years, we're doing about 10 million a year. So I get to see like the inner workings of a software company from the inside. And so that foundation combined with my painting business really gave me the, the fundamentals to be able to eventually get to painter growth. Right. Cause like I, I, I had a great leader. I had a great leader in the painting business, had a great leader um, in uh, the software company. So I got to see what great leadership was. And I think that's also something that a lot yeah. of people don't never really get to experience is really great leadership because it, it changes you. You can see what, what people can get done when led effectively. Nice shirt. Yeah. Looking sharp. Yeah. I had to, had to, I, it's hard to fit in here. I got to like scoot back or something. I got a, a box of them. We're doing a mastermind in Minneapolis next week on Thursday and Friday. And, Chose Minneapolis because Nick Slavic is coming out and uh, and Jason Paris is coming out too. So sorry to the, all the Floridians and and oh. Texans that are coming up for it. But uh, what's a mastermind? Um, so we'll have about twenty five uh, contractors plus my staff and and the speakers. So we'll have about thirty people there, and we'll do. Um, it's a two day event, and um, it's it's basically so it's completely different than the PC Expo. The PCA Expo, you go and you listen and you just learn and you absorb and you absorb and you absorb and, you absorb and then you try to go and you try to make sense of it, right? This is a two-day retreat where you just work on your business. So we're going to work on three-year goal, break that down to a one-year goal, break that down to a 90-day plan, and then come out with like weekly activities of what you need to do to achieve that 90-day plan. Um, we work on what's called our three by three. So what are our three biggest activities that we need to do this quarter? And what are the three subtasks that have to happen in order to accomplish that? Um, and then uh, we also do something called a hot seat where every we break up into groups and every person there presents their biggest challenge in their business to their group for 20 minutes in a facilitated session. And uh, they get feedback from the group and group problem solving to help that person overcome that challenge. So it's just like two days of raw working on your business and leaving with an actionable plan. We do a little bit of facilitating. Like there's a couple of sessions, like Nick's going to be teaching a session. Jason going to be session. I think I have one or two sessions, but it's like, it's like primarily like 80% working on your business, figuring out what those, you know, puzzle pieces, chess pieces are that you have to move around and leaving with like a specific action plan. Hmm. Wow. So, I mean, that's crazy. So Jason, Jason Paris is going there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I picked Minneapolis so that those guys could come and talk and not have to travel. So. Oh, I was like, okay, cool. That's pretty yeah. awesome. But those guys are like, those are the big, he's like the big dog. 
they have so many painters working for them. I mean, it's, it's funny, like Jason is, he has got a big business. I think he said they did like 10 million last year, but you talk to some of the guys at the PCA, like some of the, even some of the other residential painters like John McFadden, he's doing just about the same amount in Detroit and you've never even heard of him. <laughs> Right. Yeah. There's like, and there's like guys doing 20, 30, 40 million a year who just, you've never heard of. So it's, it's wild when you actually get perspective and, and learn things like that at the piece, not saying anything that, like Jason is, it's incredible what, what Paris Payne has accomplished. Um, but just like the quiet people that are just slaying it. It's like the perspective changes, well, you know? I didn't think he was, he's not really in his business that much anymore. Like he's like, he's, he I shouldn't don't think be. he really, like, yeah, no, I think he's like more like 20, 15 to 20 million. I thought he was more up that range more, but I think with the portfolio. Yeah, that's... Yeah, oh, gotcha. That's... And but then he's got Aleph yeah. Holdings and that's huge. I bet that's a bigger, bigger thing with that. Yeah. That one's pretty cool. But and then fun. you did you used to paint when you were a painter? Like did you paint yourself or so I, I see paint, you painting on Facebook? I painted at the here. start. Um on uh basically in my first year I painted and that's how I ended up actually um I don't know if you can see it, but I had to get uh right here, I had to get surgery. I was painting and I'm gonna do a whole podcast episode about this story. Actually, my my podcast manager uh, asked me to do this, so probably in a couple of weeks I'll do this, but I, it was like the end of the season. Um, I had a couple of painters quit on me, so I had to come back on the tools and I was helping finish up this, what ended up, you know, would, would one day become my project from hell. And I'm in the backyard and there's like a lean to, like, you know, a tin roof, like a tin corrugated roof type thing leaning on the back, back of the house. And so I had to yeah. paint a window frame above this corrugated roof. So what I did is I took like a two by 10 board and I screwed it to the top of the roof so that I could put a ladder on it. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's fine, right? So I, I go and bring my little multi-way ladder. I put it on there. It's like, okay, good to go. Grab my paint can, my scraper, uh, go up the ladder, you know, do whatever I got to do. As I'm coming back down, I go to step on the board, but the board was a little bit too close to the wall. So the ladder comes off the wall. And as it's going, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'm going. And so I go and I hit the roof and I fall through the roof 10 feet down. Luckily, a lawnmower and a concrete pad caught my fall. Um, so I went down like this and ended up dislocating my wrist and uh, having to get emergency surgery. It's still not the same. It is still I'm going to have like terrible arthritis in there. But uh, anyway, um, a few hours later, I come back to the house. Um, my painter drives me back. And as we get there, we pull up. The homeowners are standing on their front lawn with their arms crossed. And I'm coming back with like a cast and a sling and all this. And the first words out of the guy's mouth are, so what are you going to do about the roof? It's like, not, are you okay? Is everything all right? Like, oh my gosh, what happened? Like, how are you going to fix the roof? Like, thanks guys. Appreciate the care. Appreciate the compassion there. <laughs> Sounds like a normal homeowner to me. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we ended, I ended up taking that roof down and me and my, my friend who was a manager at Home Depot, um, we built like a, like a, like a cedar pergola type thing. Yeah. And it looked really great at the end. It was not super cheap, but it looked really great. They were really happy, but I, I definitely just about lost my shirt on that paint job. That was almost the very last house I ever painted. You, you know, know almost it, it, painting's, painting's so dangerous. Like people don't understand. Like I have to tell people I have to do ladder safety all the time. I'm like, look, cause I mean, I, there was one week where, I think three people got hurt on a four foot ladder and I'm like, what is going on? Like you just step off wrong. You just, you just turn wrong. Like and there's something not, like you could like anything above like 36 inches. You can like, you can literally die. Like if you landed on your head off on like a three step ladder, you would, you could die. Isn't it something like that. Yeah. I mean, you can, <laughs> I've seen people get really hurt badly. Yeah. Off and then of there's guys up on top of a 40 foot ladder without a care in the world. And you're yeah. like, dude, yeah, 40 foot, you're good, but like four foot ladder, it's dangerous. Watch that. <laughs> See, that's, I mean, that's what everybody's always using. So I think they just get like so used to it that they're like so confident and then they don't realize that how dangerous it is. I mean, those things, ladders are the, like every time I get a call, somebody has to go to the hospital, has to do with four foot ladder or like six foot ladder or small extension ladder, like, 
I mean, there's, I'm always so scared about ladders. I always tell my project managers, I'm like, Hey, check, check to make sure everybody's being safe on a ladder. Like if someone doesn't feel comfortable on a ladder, don't even let them touch it. Like, just don't stay, have them stay on the ground. Yeah. But like, like you said, the homeowners, like how they didn't, like they were just worried about their roof. Like, I mean, that's pretty understandable, but it would have been really nice if they were just like, Hey, how's your arm? I hope everything's okay. Let's figure out how to get this roof fixed. You yeah, know? exactly. Like, I trust like, you. <laughs> like, you're not going to fix it anyway. Like, that's yeah. that's kind of mean. I mean, that's I always try to think. I have a lot more respect. And, like, I'm a lot nicer to people now because of how, like, I've been treated in the past and how some of my guys have been treated by homeowners. I'm like, it. the things that they say and do, some of them are, like, it's unbelievable to me, like, how you could treat somebody that's working on your house so horribly at like the, the stories I hear, I'm just glad that I'm not in the field anymore. I'm like, I'm like, Oh yeah, that happened to you. That happened to me like 20 times. I'm like, yeah, glad you handled yeah. it. <laughs> I remember this, this one time, um, <laughs> me and another painter, we we're wrestling with this 40 foot ladder and we were just like, this was, I think in my first or maybe second year painting. And we, I didn't know every, everything about 40 foot ladders. I, I still hate them. But we didn't um, we didn't fully retract it when we were trying to move it. <laughs> so it was like it was still probably like 24, 26 feet up and we're moving it. And anyway, it catches uh, it's got like the ladder ears, whatever you call them on the top. And so it catches like a gust of wind and it starts to come down. And we're just like as I'm watching, it was like the world was in slow motion because I, as I looked at where it was going to go, there was like this brand new Beamer just sitting on the road. And I was like, it's just like coming down. And once it starts going, you have no control. There's nothing you can do. Anyways, it comes down, like, boom, right next to the car. <laughs> just missed it. I just, was like, oh, oh. there's so many today. stories. <laughs> That's so, I, I fell off a ladder one time uh, when I was younger, um, when I was painting by my, like I was actually doing the work and yeah. uh, I fell down and I caught my leg in one of the rungs and I was upside down and I didn't hit the ground. <laughs> like I fell down and I caught in there and I just was upside down. And my boss comes up to me and he's like, you're lucky. He's like, you would have been fired before you hit the ground. And I was like, he's like, oh, don't ever fall off the ladder again or you're fired. And I was like, okay. So I learned to be a lot more careful on the ladders. <laughs> That's <laughs> but, crazy. That's crazy. Getting caught by your foot. Yeah. There's so many, I have scars on my arms from, uh, I have a scar right here from a five in one in my pocket right there. I probably have one on this side too. Yep. Right <laughs> Perfect. There. Yeah. I got one right yeah. there too. Five in one. Yeah. If you put it, you know how you put them in your painter whites. Yeah. 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 I'd reach down to pick something up, come up. <laughs> Cab yourself. Yeah. So I always tell people, don't put, don't put that in your pocket like that. Yeah. Excellent, man. Well, these are all from Mexico. I got bit by mosquitoes. Oof. Yeah. Like the malaria shot. I probably have malaria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's next for you in your business, man? You having a good year? What's the, like, what's the three year forecast look like? What's the three year plan? Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah. So we are going to do, um, so we're planning on doing 5 million this year. Uh, we're on track. Um, we're doing some commercial residential and a little bit of new construction still. So what's yeah. the, what's the biggest risk for you? What would, if something happened, what would be the reason that you missed? Um, I don't, I don't know. We've been hitting all of our numbers all year. So I guess if I, if I left for um, man, 10 months, man risk. <laughs> I think if we, if I left for, for 10 months, we'd probably hit 4 million probably still. Okay. So I don't think it's that's, that that's big good. of a, yeah. So yeah, you got not, lead flow sorted. Um, I mean, it sounds like, weird. sounds like tracking sheets should probably be like worked on a little bit, like have some good sales data. Yeah, I, th I have, you know, we, we're definitely going to work on that, but uh, my production, like I have my production uh, data down and my sales data down. It's just the uh, tracking every single little thing. It's like 
so time consuming that I let a lot of the earlier stuff slip, uh, which I'm trying to get some programs for that to get that going. So I was going to do that paint scout thing. Um, I was going to do that paint scout thing on April 11th online, the live, the live thing and see if there's any good, good uh, tracking stuff for that. And then I was talking to Tanner too about his drip jobs. And I really like that, how it sends out the, how it sends out the messages up front when you're, yeah. when you load the job in, like I had one of my friends uh, put me into his drip jobs account and he's, it's been sending me these awesome emails before they even come out. But like, he's not even in this state. It's just kind of like a sample. He's just showing me how it works, you know? Can and I share so, my screen here on this? Yeah. So um, you could use this if you want. Uh, can you see my screen? Oh yeah, it worked. So this is a like a, a super like a simple sales tracking dashboard for each of your sales reps. Mm -hmm. Basically, you would like make a copy of your e of this for each one of your sales reps, and you'd be able to track mm -hmm. like all of their sales data. So if they went into like, what they would do is just every time they had an estimate schedule, they would put it here, and then what source it came from or whatever if they had that, what the outcome ends up being. So is it pending, one lost, rescheduled, canceled? If they didn't win, what was the objection that they saw? What was it booked for? And then how much deposit did they take? And then as they go through this process, um, every month it's going to aggregate their data. So how many scheduled, cancel cancellation rate, estimate slippage, close rate, total sales, deposits, bookings per estimate, revenue, cash, mm. and, and aggregate on the dashboard here. And then what you can do is track all of your sales rates dashboards month over month and see what's happening like just get a really holistic view of your sales organization mm -hmm. and use that to guide decision making right you make okay. make make decisions on coaching on hiring on firing on training on whatever allocations um but then you'll, you'll at least have a kind of like a data oriented view of the business but i'll, I'll give okay. you a copy of this yeah i like that that looks pretty cool i have i have something similar to that and then also the this um oh what's the um paint scouts it tracks a lot of that. And then the way we do it is when we get a lead, we put it into our paint scouts and then we'll put, you know, if it's pending or accepted yeah. or if it's denied. Yeah, it's like, oh. yeah, pretty much. Yeah. We just use it like that. So like when our door to door guys, they, uh, they just put all their leads into paint scout and then my sales guy comes and makes sure that they're all scheduled. And then he puts a note in there scheduled this day. And then he has it in his calendar. So like Perfect. it's pretty much as long as you can see uh, per rep data, right? Like yeah. you want to see what, what each rep sales sales data is. That's what I don't have. I mean, I have that on paint scouts because when, when he, when he schedules the estimate and then he sends them the bid, it goes and updates, updates that percentage. Yeah. So it shows like how many he closes and everything. Like I have that okay, on cool. his. But... Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's how you should be running. Like, so in my in, in painter growth now, I actually have a developer on staff who built us a whole back end portal for all of that data. And what my reps do is like at the end of every day, they'll submit it, what we call an end of day form. So they'll just say how many, how many appointments were scheduled? How many did they attend? Um, how many offers did they make? How many did they close? And then a little bit of qualitative information. I, I guess mm -hmm. also how much, how much deposit they took, revenue books, whatever. And then that will all go into our dashboard. Um, and just like you can see their, their data kind of like on a, Either, either day to day, separate together, like however we want to display the data. Um, and like being able to make data, data based decisions, like at least for me has really like ex like not exponentially, but but really allowed us to grow a lot quicker than we would have without that information. Okay, is it cool if I post this, uh, this Google Doc on the Facebook thing? Yep. Yeah, go for it. Okay, I figured give them something fun because I have a lot of painter friends that are on here and stuff too. So uh, we're trying to start a Colorado paint. We have a Colorado painting group, so we're going to be doing like meetings and stuff. So I'm trying to get a bunch of painters around Colorado um, onto this group so we can all just like meet up and hang yeah. out. Yeah, definitely, man. definitely not in Grand Junction, but like other parts of Colorado. <laughs> where I don't have I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know, my competitors can't come. <laughs> well, we, we have a lot of uh, subs, so those are kind of my competitors, but I like my subs. You. I mean, it's all like, it's I all about, um, 
like scarcity mindset versus abundance mindset. Right. Yeah. So I, I believe in a world of abundance. There's, you know, there's whatever, 8 billion people in this world. And there's, you know, 350 million people in the United States and so many paint jobs, so many more paint jobs than you'll ever be able to produce. Um, let's make everybody better so that, you know, we're at least, we're at least competing against people who know how to price jobs. Yeah. <laughs> and now they're winning on professionalism and, and like service versus trying to bid on some bid against someone who's like, you know, 40% underbidding and they don't know that they're losing their shirt, but you're not going to win the job either. So like, let's all, let's, let's raise the ships, you know? Yeah. That's, that's, that's a great way to look at it. I mean, there's so many guys that, um, you know, even I was bidding super low and just trying to get by, uh, keep my guys busy. I mean, it's like professionalize and yeah, like, yeah, that's great. I hope everybody gets some, some good coaching around here. Um, and then like a lot of my subs, man, they're so cool. Like, uh, they do so much good work and I, I want to help them out by getting them into some of these coaching programs too, to help them scale their business even. So, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, there's, there's, there's not a lot of resources out there, at least what I've seen for like the small contractor, the guy doing like under 500 K who just wants to professionalize and grow. Like there's, you know, like BTA, for example, who like they specialize in big businesses. And, um, I just really feel there's a need to help those like, you know, underserviced painting contractors. And honestly, the, the transformations that we have are so cool. Like it honestly, it makes me so happy every single time that a client shares a win or, you know, says they, they hired their first painter or they finally got off the tools or, you know, they're, they're going on their first vacation in five years. Like, it, you know, this like helping regular people do, you know, awesome things that they really want to do and be comfortable. It's, it's pretty cool to be able to do. I almost think that anyone that's in the two to three, like under 500,000 range, like they should be looking for someone like me to work with, like come, come work with me and like, I, like I got so many jobs coming in, like we can't do them all. Like we have a lot of subs that have, you know, one sub has five guys that work with him and we're keeping them busy all year, all winter. Yeah, awesome. yeah. And what do you get for gross margin on those projects? 50, 50%. You still get 50%. Like, well, you pay you plus materials, right? Yeah. Or is it 50% after materials and labor? Oh, we pay them like 40, 40% 40 and then, oh, and then we cover the materials. Dude, 50% with subs. That's great. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and they make more than, um, so like the way I try to explain it to them, I'm like, you know, our, our painters are making, they're going to make two grand, uh, with their hourly rate. This is how long it's going to take them. Uh, we're going to pay you 2,500 bucks. Um, so you get $500 more and then they're going to work twice as hard to get it done twice as fast. And they're going to, they're going to make 2,500 bucks in like two or three days. Yeah. And so I'm trying to get some of my painters because a lot of my painters are like, Hey, we want to make more money. And I'm like, yeah, you know, here's a raise, but I think you're not, you're not pay your painters piece rate. No, we have a lot of painters that are on payroll still. Not, no, you can do payroll, but you pay payroll with piece rate. You can have like a W two, but you can still pay them on piece rate. Yeah. So how we do that. And we actually, we have, I only have got like a couple of minutes left here, but um, we talked about it for an hour on, on Tuesday, we had a, a weekly call. We had like 68 or 70 painters come to our, came to our weekly call on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And we talked about piece rate for most of it. But basically how you do it. So with a sub, you'll present the job as here's, here's, a, here's a job. You know, say it's 5K. I'm going to give you $2,500 for the job. And they're like, okay, cool. I have the dollar amount. For your in-house painters, the only difference is that you, you formulate it in, in terms of hours, not in terms of dollars. So, okay, guys, this is a 100-hour job. I'm going to pay you for a hundred hours, no matter how quickly you get it done. Mm -hmm. So then they get it done in 80. You're like, great. You guys just earned a hundred dollars and then you can get a hundred hours worth of, you know, wage and you did it in 80. I'm going to pay you for the full hundred. And then on the yeah, payroll, we, like dashboard or whatever, you just give them a hundred hours instead of 80. Yeah, we did that. Uh, we did that uh, with a couple of our guys as a test run and they just like, they were still going, they weren't hitting their hours and uh, so it was costing them. There's that's either the so there's a there's either a communication issue, a skill issue, or a commitment issue. Yeah. So it's communication is like, do they know where the budget is? Do you know that? Do they know how many hours each thing is for? Okay, if they missed it, look at the whole thing. Like, yeah. Do they agree that the bedroom can be done in four hours? The kitchen can be done in six hours. The whatever can be done in this many hours. Is everything like in agreement with them? They feel like it's mm -hmm. doable. Okay, where did the job get missed? 
Yeah. Right? We probably then, had a system not set up good enough at that so that's time. That's the communication and their skill and commitment. So if, if that is like all the communication is there and then is it a skill issue? Were they up against something they just didn't have the skills to do effectively? Like if you had put a sub crew on that job, would they have got it done faster? And then the third thing is commitment. Were they bought into the end goal? Right. So is it communication skill or commitment? Figure out if it's one or more of those. And if you can solve those, you can make piece rate work with your W2s. Okay. Yeah, we'll probably we'll work, look man. You need to get there. You need to get there. We did it. We did it last year. Um, we tried it a couple of times and there's actually a couple of crews that we were like, hey man, get this job done faster. We'll we'll give you, you know, a certain amount if you hit this percentage. Like we're kind of doing it with a couple guys, but it's definitely something that I want to work on uh, this so year too. That's are you crazy. using drip jobs yet? No. Well, how do you how do you estimate at the moment? Uh, we estimate through Paint Scout. We have the we have all the stuff on there. Okay. When you create a quote on Paint Scout, does it break down each section in terms of number of hours? Um. Yeah. Okay. So print that out. Number of hours. Don't need the dollar amount there, but just how many hours each thing is for and bring that to the next job with your W2s. And just like, they can be on hourly for that, but be like, okay, so you guys are still on hourly. So like work, work how you normally would, but this job is worth this many hours. Like here's the bedroom. How many hours is that? Okay. Do you think you can do that? And then just go through everything. And even if they miss it, you can say, okay, here's a piece of paper, write down how many hours everything you think everything should be. And mm -hmm. like get each person and see where it's off and see where expectations are different. And you'll okay. find that like, if you break it down like that, they're just jackassing. You'll find they're just wasting time on things. They're taking too long in between color changes or tools or setup takedown. Like as long as they're putting paint on the walls, they're making money. But I bet there's just that time in between that they're just being less than a hundred percent efficient. Okay. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a great idea. Motivate them to be a hundred percent efficient. Yeah, if you're not putting paint on the wall, you're not making money. <laughs> because that's what the subs are, man. The subs are they're trying to make money. They're out there Dude, to start how their fast, business. How fast can you get a tool on the wall? Right. That's what it's about. Yeah. So, well, cool, man. Well, shoot that. I think that went long, huh? <laughs> we did a I'm whole hour. I could talk to you all day, dude. Um, I got, I got a few interviews here, but um, I would love to keep chatting. Um, I'll yeah, get we'll you on the PG podcast soon. I'd love that. Yeah. I think I was trying to ask you to put me on there at the PCA. That PCA was just an absolute blast. I mean, I don't, I, it was, yeah, it was a, it was, a, it was, a, it was like a, just a fuzzy mess, you know, conversations and beers and it was a good time <laughs> i feel like i wish you could just do like five or six more hours a night of just like hanging out with everyone yeah. it's like if then you like look at your watch at lunch, 1 a.m you're like oh i gotta go to bed let's start at lunch next time yeah <laughs> but cool man well thanks for getting on here and uh yeah we'll talk soon and uh, yeah let's do it man stoked to chat next time and hey if anyone uh anyone listens to this um right to the end and they want to check out what we're doing here. Um, we'll, we'll shoot another 500 bucks off any of our coaching programs. If, if you mention this podcast. Mm. Cool. And I'll post that at the bottom too. Sick. Sweet. Thanks. Thanks man.